Good morning, church. Man, I don't know about you, but uh, that was uh, that was some intense time of <laughs> worship uh, in you know song in the spirit and praise in that regard. I know it was only a couple songs, but it seems like you know <clears throat> when you just tap in, or should I say, allow the Holy Spirit <laughs> to come forth out of you and receive praise and adoration from your lips and your being it seems almost like time just kind of sits still amen and you just find yourself uh, wrapped in in time of worship with the lord it's a beautiful thing uh uh you know our worship team is comprised of two people but it's perfect for us and i think uh michelle and isaiah do a fabulous job so not praising them but just grateful that they allow the Lord to work through them in a way that uh, ushers us into the <clears throat> the presence of the Lord in that regard. Um, you know, I ain't gonna lie; it's been a, it's been a crazy week. You know, um, I know everyone's going through through different things, and and I get the sense that things are getting more intense because as time draws near and closer, you know, the Lord is uh, gonna return, and we're gonna head into a season of some. Uh, some catastrophic things going to pop off. But, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be catastrophic for the, the house of God, the true believers in Jesus Christ. We uh, need to do our part and hunker down and God bless you and make sure that we're, uh, we're doing what we need to do, being faithful witnesses to him, making sure our relationship is right with him. That way we can be uh, accessible and we can be clean vessels, amen, for his usage because... Uh, there's a dying world out there. Uh, people are walking dead men and women. They have no idea. They're following the Pied Piper straight to hell. And so, you know, we, we need to reflect the light of Jesus uh, in order to, to see people uh, come to faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, I'm sure some of uh, the women uh, know um, my wife had to share. Well, it's, a, it's bittersweet, you know, that uh, her, 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 uh, her cousin's husband passed away on Friday. Friday at about 3 p.m. They pronounced him dead. Uh, and he's gone on with the Lord. So, uh, you know, amen that he knew him. I think that's the most important thing to, 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 to get from it. Uh, obviously, the, the family is going to go through their, their own season of, of grief. And sometimes those things never leave. But you come to terms with it as uh, you, you walk with the Lord that, that he has a better plan. And that he knew that Rob needed to go. And so, uh, you know, that's been difficult for, for, for uh, that family, obviously. So just continue to keep them in prayer. The good thing is they have a strong support system of, of true, faithful uh, Christian brothers and sisters. So they're going to be okay. It's not going to be easy, but they're, they're going to get through. Um, I, I have a gentleman that when I used to go to the herd years ago, men's group on Tuesday night at uh, the old church that Chip Ingram used to uh, pastor in uh, Los Gatos. And uh, this man still keeps in touch with me. Good friend of mine. And he sent me uh, something that, that I, I felt led to, to share this morning. It's, I'm not going to be long-winded about it, but I think it's very important. I think it's poignant for our time uh, now uh, in the hustle and bustle of life and, and the different things that go on in, in, our, in our culture and our society today. And uh, I do believe it ties in directly to our message. So I'm going to share that real quick. Uh, it says, comfort is a multi-trillion dollar business. Salespersons come at you with the trinity of comfort, items to comfort your body, things to comfort your mind, and even things to try to comfort your spirit. We spend a lot of this lifetime looking for comfort. One of the biggest sources for discomfort is the fact that we were made for fellowship with God and his people. Without God and his people in close relationship in our lives, we find ourselves victims of the proverbial hole in our souls. It's astounding that most of us know about this hole, but very few will respond to it appropriately. A hole means something is missing, but instead of seeking God, more often than not, we seek and we will listen to the voice or voices that say, you need this car, you need this beer, or need this food or more money or sex or drugs or on and on we can go. We've tried it all, but we cannot get enough food, beer, and the car only lasts until it breaks down. We can't get enough money. Sex and pornography perverts us until we're no good for the person who loves us and on and on. None of these things are truly sources of lasting comfort and peace. 
the Apostle Paul was living under the worst conditions when he said, not that I have ever, not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or an empty, with plenty or little. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Oh man, that's so beautiful, right? That's what that verse means. It doesn't mean I can do whatever I want in Jesus Christ. It's I can do whatever the Lord, whatever is going to glorify the Lord, I can do all things through Jesus Christ who strengthens me. It's not, a, it's not to win a football game. <laughs> you know, they, they post that on, on some locker rooms. Oh, oh I'm going to get 15 sacks tonight. No, it's not what it's about. It's about honoring the Lord. I'm going to end with this thought on this. This is very poignant. Oh, man, this hit me so hard, and I hope it speaks to you. I was once in a room with a person who was dying. The room was filled with loved ones. The only person in the room that was content was the person who was dying. As they looked to us and said, I see you, Jesus. Even though they were too weak to raise their arms physically, I sensed their spiritual arms were outstretched and embracing Jesus as they passed from this world to the next. They were the only person in the room who was comfortable. Isn't that striking? The only person in the room that was comfortable was the person that was dying. Everyone else was uncomfortable. We can live a lifetime of comfort if we are filling ourselves with the right thing, the Holy Spirit. Oh man, as I read that this earlier this week, I mean, I was just struck. Like, you know, what am I filling my days with? What am I filling my life with? This morning, what are you filling your days with? What are you filling your life with? You see, if we have our priorities right and we're filling our lives and our hearts with the, with the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, oh man, <laughs> you're going to have a blast, you know? Things are going to be difficult, but you're going to have a blast. You're going to have a peace and a contentment that stretches far beyond what this life can ever offer you. And I pray that this morning, that's where you find yourself. That's where we should find all of ourselves. Digging deeper, more into the Holy Spirit, the presence of God, hearing from Him, hearing from Him correctly, and living in obedience. With that, we're going to find ourselves in Revelation chapter 2. We'll be going through verses 5 to 7 this morning. So, Again, if you're able to, uh, please stand for the reading of God's word and we'll go ahead and pray and we'll get into our message this morning. Very excited. This is a great passage of scripture and I I know it's going to speak to our hearts this morning. Okay. Remembering therefore, therefore, excuse me, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Verse 6. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for uh, your, your, your presence in our lives. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the shed blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. We proclaim in this church that there is no other way to heaven but through the acceptance of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Lord, we are grateful for that. And Lord, we pray that you'd speak to us through your word this morning. Show us the importance of correction and reproof. Show us how to repent and also encourage us for the great reward that awaits us if we continue on in a lifestyle of repentance and being right before you because of your son, Jesus. Father, we thank you and praise you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Things are heavy, but uh, there's a lightheartedness about knowing the Lord. It can be heavy. Things are, it's good for things to be heavy in the sense that you, uh, you know the value of things that should be valued. And you can differentiate between what's not necessary and what's necessary. Uh, you know, Solomon penned and he spoke of, we should be thinking a whole lot more about death than trying to live it up in this life. And it's not to be morbid because that's totally the wrong context of what he said. 
It's put in perspective the brevity of this life and how immensely important every nanosecond you live, I live. It's a gift from God. The fact that your uh, your cognitive and your body functions properly right now, your kidneys, your liver processes things the way it's supposed to. Your bloodstream is flowing with blood. Your heart is pumping without having a skip. Your, your, your brain is able to execute functions accurately. That's a beautiful thing. And that can be taken at any moment in time. And so with that, let us not take lightly the gift of life, the breath in our lungs that we have at this very moment. Today we will continue in our study uh, in the letter to the Ephesian church. We, we have already learned that Jesus com- uh, commended them for their steadfast endurance. That was a good thing. And, and the fact that they didn't tolerate evil teachings. So that was very good on their part. You know, they were Bereans in that sense that they remembered and they were like, okay, yes, uh, I'm not going to subscribe to no kind of false doctrine and I'm going to allow the Holy Spirit to speak into my life. So they were good on that front. Um, but he also, speaking of Jesus Christ, had to confront them uh, because they had abandoned their first love, which was him. They had abandoned this relationship with Jesus Christ, with, which is vital to uh, the health and, and prosperity spiritually, whatever, monetarily, if you will. But you're going to steward everything well if you have uh, your love with Christ in its first priority, being the first priority in your life, him seating uh, on, on the seat of your heart. Today we will learn about what they could do about their situation and how they could experience lasting joy forever and ever. You know, we talked about it last week. The Lord never leaves you with, I'm just gonna, he's going to confront you about something, convict you about something, and not show you what can be done about it. There's something that needs to be corrected in your life, in my life. He doesn't leave it at that. He shows you, okay, this is what you need to do. Correct it, and it'll be done. And not only that, but he encourages you with, hey, this is the reward. Remember, um, why, why, this is why Paul said, I want to run the race and run the race well. It wasn't a race against another person or another believer. That's foolishness. Again, out of context. Once you accept Jesus Christ in your heart as Savior and Lord, at that second, the race begins for you. The race begins for me. And we need to live out our lives in the idea and the concept that we're going to run that race well. And when the ticker on top of our head is up and it's our time to go before the Lord, we could say that we ran our race well. Amen. You know, it's unfortunate that a lot of people die with a lot of regret and a lot of fear and a lot of disappointment because they realize on that deathbed, I wasted a lot of time. I really understand now what's important and I wasn't living for what was important. May we be those that when our time comes, we can be like that person with outstretched hands that's comfortable, that's content, that's like, all right, Lord, this is it. You know, I get to go before you and, and, and I'm leaving this, this, this life. We want to be those who are content in Christ. Amen. Today, again, we will learn about what they can do to experience true joy and lasting peace forever. If you've ever wondered how could you have lasting victory in your walk with Jesus Christ. Today, this message is for you. <laughs> if you've ever wondered, how can, I, how can I have victory every day of my life in Jesus? Like that song said, again, I didn't tell Michelle, we didn't have a conversation, uh, what they're singing about, what, they're, what Isaiah's playing about, talking about I can, I can sing in the troubled times, I can sing when I win. How can you do that? You, get, you keep short accounts with the Lord. You have a personal walk with Him. That communion is, is not tight. K-N-O-T. Not tight. Nobody can undo it. In that regard, you can have true victory and lasting joy forever and ever. There's several main points for our message this morning. And the first one is this. True repentance, authentic repentance, is vital to getting back on track with Jesus Christ. You know, we're, we're living in a time where there are many demon-possessed pastors and preachers. And they have omitted the teaching of hell itself from the pulpit. 
They have omitted the term repentance from the pulpit in the hopes that they're going to retain people and amass numbers, but most importantly, unbeknownst to them, or maybe beknownst to them, being under the influence of demonic spiritual uh, powers, that it's an affront to God, and they're, they're trying to draw, uh, Satan is drawing as many away as he can from, from the Lord, because he knows his time is short. And I pray that, you know, that would never happen within this church body. Hell will be preached here. Uh, the reality of hell and what people have to look forward to if they reject God. Whether they like it or not, you reject God, you die rejecting God, you will go to hell. Uh, we will teach about repentance and what repentance means, true repentance. You see, notice Jesus didn't tell the, the Ephesian church, work harder or do more works. Stay truer or be truer in your rejection of false doctrine and you're going to be right with me. No, he said, repent, repent. Some of the works were there and works will always be there, meaning uh, the, the byproduct of your life changed by Christ will always be there. But you see, if our adoration, meaning our, 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 our affection, if our affection is given to the wrong person or the wrong thing, our works will be counted as worthless. And this is, this is what the Ephesian church was going through. Right? They, they had good works. But in that statement, when Jesus said, but, now he's saying, repent, because you abandoned your first love. Those, those good works were, at that moment, counted as nothing because they forgot their first love notice there is a consequence for not repenting so i mean you know jesus christ is crystal clear he makes it crystal clear that a that a that a, that a four-year-old right could comprehend this and understand the, the basic concepts of right and wrong you need to correct what's wrong if you don't correct what's wrong this is what's going to happen and he's speaking to believers this is this is not to unbelievers who've already shut out jesus christ and said i want to live for myself, I want to live for my own glory. I want to live for my life. No, he is speaking to people who claim to be believers. So he's speaking to you and I today as the church of Jesus Christ. He's saying if we refuse to repent, that the lamp stand, the lamp stand, excuse me, will be taken away. This is a very important warning to all about the state of their minds and what we fix our minds upon. Hebrews chapter. 12 verses 1 through 2 tell us, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. This is a beautiful thing, and this is what we're supposed to emulate. Again, understanding what is what is set before us. You know, you're, you're going to go through periods of life where you're going to have to endure shame for the glory of God. You're going to have to endure being despised for your beliefs in Jesus Christ. Are you willing to be counted as a fool for Jesus? Are you willing to be talked about behind your back for the sake of Christ? Or will you buckle? Because maybe it's even your family, your own flesh and blood, people closest to you who say, oh, I despise you because you're a believer in Jesus. That's how we have to be willing to count the cost, right? What, what builder builds a home and doesn't count the cost of how much it's going to cost? I got to lay a foundation. I, I, I got to get all the, the product. I got to hire the, 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 man, the, the, the manpower to be able to build this thing and to erect it and raise it up. Only a fool goes into a, 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 a plan like that without counting the cost. So we have to count the cost. What is it going to cost us to live for Christ? And, and if you haven't hit that rocky patch in your walk with Christ, well, just wait. It'll come. You young people who haven't experienced nothing. Oh, man, it's all good. I'm coasting. I'm chilling. Or maybe young people, you've been through a whole lot. I, I'm, who am I to say you haven't been through something? All I'm saying is... If you're on a stretch of, of nice greenery, it's going to get rocky and thorny at some point. 
and you need to be girded in the truth so you don't fall away when adversity strikes because Satan is on the lurk overtime right now. And he's trying to hit up people just like you and me, trying to cause division within the church, trying to cause division in your marriage, trying to cause division in your home, strife. All those things are byproducts of Satan knowing his time is running out. And he's after believers. He don't care about all the people that are, oh, I'm, I'm all about pluralism. I'm all about, you know, you could be any sex you want. He's already got those people. He's already got the, the bishops that are saying that, you know, Jesus Christ, uh, you know, you don't need to have a relationship with him. It's all good. Follow us. We got false teachings, but we cloak it in, in righteousness, false righteousness. He doesn't care about those people. He cares about true believers of Jesus. So you can't be deceived. Don't ever let me or anyone else who comes up here in this pulpit teach you without you discerning what's going on. Use the intellect that God's given you inspired by the Holy Spirit for you to be able to ration what is going on. Is this person teaching me doctrinal tr truth or not? And like I said, many people are, are doing all kinds of stuff right now. They're teaching all kinds of things contrary to what the Bible says. Don't let it go down in your soul all easy because that's what Satan does. He sugarcoats sin and makes it palatable to taste. But once it goes into your belly, it rots your bones. Oh, it rots your soul. Don't be deceived, my friends. The second main point is this. Nothing will ever change in our lives if we don't listen to the Lord's instruction for us and do what he says. Nothing <laughs> will ever change in your life if you hear what God is telling you and you turn a blind eye to it. And you say, not now. I don't want to do that. I am going to continue the way I want to go. Then don't expect things to go good in your life. And I'm not talking about, oh, you're going to receive this and receive that. I'm talking about the... He'll get you one way or another. He'll get you one way or another. I'm talking about the intangible things. I'm talking about the peace, the joy, the comfort that come from Him, that come from His hand. You will never experience that if you are disobedient and you continue to live in a lifestyle of disobedience. It's worse. It's worse on a person who hears from the Lord and, con and continues to reject rather than someone that's already lost in their sin and they just they don't care. It's worse off for someone who's walked with the Lord and then says, I'm going to go my own way. Don't, don't go that way. Don't allow yourself to be led astray by the teaching of demons and demonic activity. Don't allow it. It's so real. I'm not saying be sucked into that, but sometimes we think this whole thing doesn't exist, but we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So what are we wrestling against? We're wrestling against spiritual principalities and principalities of, of evil in, in heavenly places and demonic forces that are a front to Jesus Christ and are always on the attack. They're always on the attack. You know, everything that's in the spiritual realm manifests itself in the physical in some way, shape or form. Spouses, you know this. I know this in my own marriage. I know this with my kids. I'm living right. Why am I coming against this? Why is this happening? Why is this frustration I can't pinpoint? Why, why, why are these things happening? Because Satan is stirring up trouble because he knows he can't deceive the elect. And so since he can't deceive the elect, he wants to render you and I useless for the kingdom of God. And how does he do that? By having us stuck in a frustrated state, in a season of bitterness, in a season of division, when we're supposed to be coming together. I'm not talking about all-inclusive, because <laughs> that gets mixed up nowadays too. I'm talking about within the church within your family unit, within your community, being together, working things out for the, for the cause of Christ. He wants, to, he wants to null and void that and render you and I useless. And so we need to be aware of this so we can be effective for the Lord. Amen? Going back to this idea that without listening and being obedient, nothing's going to change. You see, we live in a day and age where social media has made it possible for nearly everyone and their mama to have a platform to speak. 
Don't you notice that? Everybody got something to say. Everybody got something to say. Man, everybody's got an opinion. I'm not going to go there with, you know, everybody, got, you know, but I'm saying everyone's got an opinion. Everyone's got a voice. This can be a good thing. It could be a good thing, but it also can be a serious problem because everyone's clamoring to speak. <laughs> Shouting over each other to be heard. Everybody wants to speak. Everybody wants to, I want my voice to count. <laughs> Again, that's a, that's a side note, but that's another thing that Satan does is Satan makes it all about you. If you find yourself constantly always being about yourself, man, Satan's doing a job on you because that's what Satan does. He makes it about the individual because it's a distraction away from what's truly going on. You see, I get the sense that people are screaming over one another to be heard. You know, that analogy like crabs in a, in a barrel or a bucket. <laughs> They're all fighting. They're all clawing against one another to find their way out. Who's going to be the first one to get out of this barrel? That's how it is on social media with everybody speaking, everyone talking. Everyone's got an opinion about something. So with so many people trying to be heard, who's really listening? Everybody's talking. Nobody's listening. People think they're, 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 they're listening or being heard, but the other person's already formulating their rebuttal. So they're not listening. I know this because this goes on with me and my wife at home. My wife's like, you don't listen. <laughs> you're over here formulating what you want to say, but you're not hearing me. You're not hearing. <laughs> you're already coming up with your own rebuttal. And that's how it is in the bigger scheme of things. Many of us are already, we're not hearing the, people, the other person talking. We're already formulating our own idea. No, I don't like that. I like that. You know, we need to learn. We need to, we need to be trained on how to listen, how to hear the Holy Spirit. You see, too many cooks in the kitchen doesn't really produce a good meal. Oh, I think there, there needs to be a little more pepper. You forgot the paprika. I need these kind of onions. You know what? This isn't a meal fit for 15 people trying to cook it. Let the cook cook. Maybe you could do the prep work, <laughs> but we need to let the cook cook. You see, if we are not inclined to listen to one another as human beings who we can see physically, how much less are we inclined to listen to God who we can't see? Right? It doesn't take a rocket scientist to try to, you, you weigh that out and you're like, okay, yes, I get it. Because, like, oh, I don't see God, so I don't, I don't got to listen. But we have the word of God. We have his principles found in, in the word. And so we need to hear him. We need to listen to him. You see, the key to a redirected life of fulfillment in Jesus Christ has a lot to do with how well we listen to him and how well we implement what he's telling us to do. The reality is, if he's given you a task to do, if he's given you a direction, he will give you the means by which to do it. We say, oh, I can't do it. It's too hard. It's too difficult. The strongholds on my life, they have me bound, right? That's where you know, addiction, oh, I can't, I can't do it. I'm addicted. Jesus can break those addictions and those strongholds in a matter of moments. A lot of it has to do with, are we willing to be broken of these things? You see, many times our love of the world supersedes our desire to want to be broken from the things of the world. And so that's why we end up in this sin, repent, sin, repent. I, don't, I, I know we're going to sin. What I'm talking about is a subservient lifestyle to sin where we constantly find ourselves in a lifestyle battle against sin. May it be that that individual's desire, or if I'm speaking to you today, or your desire is more for the things of the world than Jesus' correction. That's why we find ourselves in trouble. We need to be more, have more of a desire to want to please Him than to please ourselves by the things of this world or the people of this world. Amen? The third main point is this. This is a beautiful thing. There is a great reward, reward, excuse me, for those who take heed to the Lord's correction. You see, Jesus told them, whoever has an ear to listen should do so. If they are obedient and allow the Holy Spirit to guide them in correction, they will be invited to eat from the tree of life. 
they will be rewarded with eternal life with God in the paradise he created forever. You see, a humble view of who Jesus Christ is, is essentially everything in the Christian faith. Right there, that's everything. Without a proper perspective of who Jesus Christ is, we will never be ready to repent. And without true repentance, we will remain enemies of God, not children of God. But if we submit and obey, there will be a great reward for us. And that's a beautiful thing, right? It's, there's going to be a reward for us. Peace, joy, forever. No, you're, you're no longer going to be an enemy of God, but you're going to be called friend. You are adopted into his family. God bless you. You are grafted into the tree of his family, the lineage of, of his family. And, and that's a beautiful thing. We were, uh, I was talking with Gene Scott earlier this morning, and uh, you know, I got inspired listening to a message uh, from, a, from a, uh, just a, a great man of God. And, and, and he spoke of you know, Satan's uh, ploy is... If he, can get, if he can get you to debate about godly principles, that's it. If he can get you to debate. Think about Eve. When Satan came to Eve, he had to come crafty. And he used, it, he used that, that serpent. And he spoke to the serpent, which is a crafty, slithery creature to begin with. And he spoke in a way, and he had her question. If Satan can get you to question the validity of God's word... He's already half, more than halfway there in converting you in the sense of you, you, you and I have to put our foot on the ground and say this is truth and nothing that comes against it can, can change my opinion. You see, because this is what Satan will do. And, and she gladly obliged. He just said, did, did, did God not say? He, 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 he posed the question. So then now it opened up the opportunity for a debate. If you find yourself debating or not whether the Bible is real, once again, I believe, directed by the Holy Spirit, that, 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 that Satan's doing a number on you. Because he's trying to get you to debate on whether or not this word of God is truly the word of God. It has to be settled in your heart and soul once and for all. The principles found in this book are true. They're righteous. They're holy. They're real. It doesn't matter what the culture says today. We live in a culture now where they want this whole plural thing going on. All these terms <laughs> that they're using to try to numb people away. I mean, the reality is they started, well, they didn't start with, but, you know, if you notice, the Pledge of Allegiance. They took out under God. Then they took out the Pledge of Allegiance entirely. You know, I, again, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see all these things are moving further and further away from biblical truth and true freedom in Christ and liberty and justice for all, which, 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 which our country once stood for. And now it's becoming this, this just disaster. And it's going to get ugly and it's going to get bloody and it's going to get real messy. So for us as believers, we need to stay rooted and girded in truth. So we're not swayed. You could give up on the, 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 the Republican and Democratic Party. The, those ideas are, are old. <laughs> because they've, they've now become progressive in their thinking. There's pockets of true Democrats and Republicans. But those who are having influence and are, are, are being able to wield power and influence, they are not people of, of, of those core beliefs. And so we need to rest in Christ. We need to rest in Christ. Again, the, the main thing is, who's in your sphere of influence? You need, to, you need to, I need to be affecting those people for change in Jesus. Because that's how it happens. You know? Can the Lord raise up a Billy Graham again? Sure. Will he? I have no idea. But you can be a pillar in your family. You can be a pillar in your community. You can stand for Christ when no one else around you looks like they're standing for Christ. That's how you can win, uh, run your race and end well, and you'll get that well done, good and faithful servant. That's a beautiful thing to want to hear. I want to hear that. I pray I hear it. I don't, want, I don't want to look back on my life and see, I just wasted so much time. I wasted so many race, uh, resources. I wasted so much energy on things that were worthless and useless when there's a dying world, maybe there's that family member that only you can reach. 
that coworker that only you can speak into their lives in a way where they're actually going to listen because under the influence of the Holy Spirit in your life, because you have authority. Remember, we have authority. We have victory. It's not all doom and gloom. But I, I, I don't like painting a picture where it's all a bed of roses because it's not, you know? I mean, our brothers and sisters in Christ in other countries, they know. They, they're, they've been feeling the brunt uh, 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 of the wickedness that goes on. And I just pray that when it hits us, we're going to be ready. And we're not going to be lulled to sleep, as unfortunately some Christians are. And I don't even know why they're calling themselves Christians, because they don't live by the principles of the Bible. It's not a club. <laughs> It's not the Boy Scouts. We don't just get in by paying some money. Your ties do not make you right with God. They don't make me right with God. It's a true confession. And when that true confession happens, you know, you know your life is altered. You can't go back. You can't live the way you used to live. The things that you used to indulge in, they disgust you now. You know, I was talking with Lou earlier before the service. You know, I, I don't know his niece like that. But my heart was grieved by the things that I heard because it's that, that, that Holy Spirit that's grieved. by you know, He doesn't want to see things the way they are. He doesn't want to see people going astray, doing what's right in their own eyes. It's for our benefit that we have the, the parameters that we have to safeguard our souls. When we get so off in whatever we want to do that's going to feed our senses, feed our, our carnal instincts... Those things are destructive. And Satan knows that. And he knows that we're, we're easy to please in the sense of immediate gratification. I, 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 I really do. I hate McDonald's. But sometimes I find myself eating it. And then I eat it and I'm so disgusted with myself after. And after. <laughs> if you know what I mean. Because it's disgusting. I'm like, this is, not, this is not good for me. This is not good for my body. That's the same thing with our soul. There are things that are good for our souls to nourish us, and there are things that are disgusting. We, not, we, we need not be led into things that are disgusting for our souls. Amen? All right. Let's go ahead and uh, break down these verses. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm like fired up. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm just grateful. I just pray, Lord, don't take your spirit from me. I want to run hard for you. I know you all feel the same. We want to run hard for Jesus. This is a real church. This ain't a fake church. Revelation chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have, that you hate the works of the Nic Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Okay, so Jesus starts with this statement. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. The first step in restoration for the Ephesian church was for them to remember. Remember. Think about it. Ponder it. Reflect upon the past, what has happened. They needed to remember from where they have fallen. This means remembering where they used to be in their love for the Lord and for one another. Uh, great example. Just think of the prodigal son, right? Prodigal son in the pig pen. He said, I want... My inheritance. Okay. Father's like, okay. You know, there, there's some things as parents, I'm learning this uh, as, a, as a younger parent. I can't save my kids from things. There are certain lessons they have to learn by making their own choices. All I can do is set the table to the best of my ability. Pour into them as much as I can. But the reality is they're their own people. They have to make their own decisions. And some of those decisions are going to be wrong ones. And they're going to have to discern, I made a wrong choice. What do I do now? The prodigal son, he got his money. He lived large. He did the Vegas thing. He lived recklessly. He had the parties. He had the fancy clothes. He had all of what the world could offer him. Oh, man, he got it in. He lived like a baller. As some of these young people will say, maybe I'm dating myself. Maybe there's a new term for making a lot of money. I don't know. I thought it was baller. Anyways, <laughs> he was in that pig pen eating with the pig's ate. No, bacon tastes good, but they're pretty disgusting creatures if you think about it. They don't like being clean. They stink. They smell. There's always flies around them. 
They like rolling around in mud. They like rolling around in their own feces. You disgusting animal. Maybe that's why uh, the Hebrews were not supposed to eat animals like that. Man, I like me some bacon, though. Boy, sausage. Woo! I would not be a good Muslim because that's a, that's a stronghold I wouldn't give up. All right, all right, enough pops. I'm sorry. I'm just saying. The bottom line is, and I'm not poking fun. It is what it is. But the reality is, when he was in that pig pen, he remembered what living with his father was like. Luke chapter 15, I'll read it because it's important, 17 through 19. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Man, he got it. He got the conviction. He got the conviction. He got the repentance. He had a repented mind, right? You see, we have to have a repented mind, right? Because where our head goes, our body will follow. This whole thing, and you know, Lou said it before, oh, I pray to the universe. Oh, I feel with my heart. Oh, man. You go with your heart, you're going to go all kind of places. Trust me, I've been there, done that. Won't, don't want to go back again. Going with your heart does not lead to good places, let me tell you. Our emotions are so fickle. That's why in grade school, you can have three girlfriends in one week. Oh, Cindy Lou's so beautiful, I love her. The next day, Amy's the best one. Next one, Cheryl. Next one, Janiqua, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> I'm just throwing names out there. But it's real. You can't go based on your heart. Your mind has to come under submission to the true Lord and understanding who he is. And then everything else will follow. The application is this. This is always the first step in getting back to where we should be with the Lord. To remember what Jesus Christ has done for you and I. This is why it's so important to remember the cross of Calvary. It can never get stale. You know what? I will be so honest with you. It's only by the supernatural act of the Holy Spirit in my life that the cross of Christ doesn't get old. I come here every week refreshed. I go through every day refreshed daily because the Holy Spirit is doing something that I could never do. He's making aware to me the reality of His Son, Jesus Christ, and what has been done on that cross for me. And as wicked as my sins were, some that I could never pronounce to you because of embarrassment and shame, the Lord says, I have not, chosen not to remember those things. As far as the east is from the west, I have, I have not. They're, they're buried in the sea. Oh, my goodness. That reality, the depth of his love, the depth of security found in him, the fact that you don't have to face wrath. You don't have to face wrath. You will not go to that burning pit of sulfur while there will be gnashing of teeth and there will be wailing and there will be such cries of, I wish I would have accepted Christ, but now I'm stuck here where the demons, it was meant for demons and Satan, and it's not going to be a party. Satan's not going to be happy. The demons ain't going to be happy. You're not going to be happy. Well, you're not going there, but I'm just saying, right? It's this whole understanding of you've been saved from that. Oh, my goodness. Your soul becomes overjoyed day after day, and that's a beautiful thing. Remember, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a lifetime of little steps of faithfulness and obedience that make a true believer. And you, the more you obey, the more you submit, the more you are faithful, you grow in strength. You go in, grow in courage. You grow in all these things that allow you to be a solid, useful witness and servant for the Lord. And you're not able to be penetrated by the fiery arts, uh, darts of the, of the enemy, the arrows that come your way. You're able to discern them. And with the power of the Holy Spirit within you, you're able to pick them off one by one. And though you may be tempted... You don't succumb to that temptation because, you know, you get clicked with the holy stick real quick and you remember, oh, no, I, I don't do that. I, I don't want to go there, right? You know, because fantasizing about things, when we entertain thoughts too long, those thoughts can easily become actions. And that's why people cheat on their taxes or do credulous things in their business or walk out on their marriage and commit adultery. 
or abuse their children or stand up in the pulpit and live one lifestyle and do all kind of crazy things outside of the pulpit on Sundays because they've entertained a thought and they've entertained a fantasy. And that's what Satan would love to do, would draw people away from the truth. So we have to be girded in truth. We do that by keeping short accounts with the Lord. It's all things that I can't explain it better than that. It's a supernatural act. But when you are in submission to Jesus Christ, these things start taking effect in your life and you start getting it. You're like, wow, okay. No, I don't like that. I don't want to do that. I want to do this. Lord, help me to do this. Help me to live for you. You see, there's also a great danger in not responding quick enough to the conviction that the Lord allows to come into your life. You see, your heart and my heart can become hard to the point that our conscience now becomes seared and we no longer subscribe to the things of the Lord. We can't even hear them. Think about Pharaoh. That's what happened to Pharaoh. Pharaoh just too many times. No, I'm going to do my own thing. So eventually the Bible says the Lord hardened his heart. That's a whole other topic. I don't want to get into that. But the reality is I believe that the Lord allowed his heart to become hard. You know, people take that literal and say, oh, the Lord hardened his heart. Well, it also says that Moses hardened his heart. It also says that Pharaoh also hardened his heart. So which one is it? Moses, a man can't harden another man's heart. Pharaoh made the decision and God said, okay, you refuse to submit. You refuse to obey. You refuse to repent. I'm going to hand you over to what you want. And I'm still going to accomplish my purposes through your disobedience. And that's exactly what happened. But that's what can happen if if we say, no, I don't want to repent. I don't want to turn from my wicked ways. I don't want you to speak into my life then unfortunately God may hand you and I over. And that's a sad thing. We never want to see any believer go down that road. There's always time for restoration. Um, You look at King David. Some wicked things happened in his life. He was restored. He he may have not been restored to the prominent position he once was in. We know that the the sword would never leave his home. We know that all the crazy details of the things that went, went, went on within his dysfunctional family. And let me tell you, we all have dysfunctional families. The encouragement should be you look back in the word of God and you find all kind of dysfunction. Oh, my goodness. Well, if these people were dysfunctional and people like that can end up in the, house, in, in, in the, in the hall of faith, then, man, Lord, there's hope for me. <laughs> I'm not a nut because my family's whacked out. Every one of us, we, we have family ties that are whacked out. That's just the reality. You know, I'll tell you straight up. I didn't even meet my dad until I was like 20 something years old. He already had Alzheimer's and he didn't even know who I was. You know, I got two. I got three older siblings. We have the same dad, different mom. So we all have dysfunction. But the reality is. Where do we go from there? Do we allow the Lord to speak into our lives so that. We can repent, get right. And end up on the right end of the ledger because we've received the grace and mercy of the Lord through his son, Jesus Christ. You see, this matter of repentance is a very serious thing. Like I alluded to earlier, there are some churches, unfortunately, now that will not teach on repentance. They have omitted this term for fear of offending churchgoers. Well, first of all, we're not churchgoers. We're disciples of Christ. A churchgoer is someone who just comes and sits in a seat. There's no effect in their life. There's no application of the truth. There's no, there's no real change in their lives. They just come. This does not make you right before God. Your heart submitted to him in obedience to God Almighty. That's what makes you right before God because you accept Jesus Christ as your only means of being right. You see, we could, like I said, we could dot all our I's and cross all our T's and still have a wicked heart. You could sit in these seats for 60 years and still end up in hell because you never truly made the conversion. It's not about this. This is all outward stuff. It's what's going on in here. And what's going on in here is going to manifest itself in your life, in the people that you live around, in your community. I don't care if they're believers or not. The way you live, your character, 
um, how it comes out. That's going to show the true fruit of whether your life has been changed, altered forever by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Repentance. It's not a command to feel sorry or to really feel anything. I think that's where Christians get it misconstrued. Should there be a sense of, oh, I feel horrible for what I did? Yeah, there, there, there should be a sense of that. That's called your conscience. That's your conscience. That's a God-given thing to help you. That's kind of like a, like a meter in a car that's alerting you that uh, your oil is bad and you better change it before your engine burns out. But that's not the end-all, be-all. And some of us, unfortunately, think, well, uh, I emotionally feel this way, so, you know, uh, I must, it must be good. But the reality is this. True repentance means a change of direction, to go a different way. It's, it's for your mind literally to change. Change the way you think. Change the way I think. To come under the submission of the Word of God and allow God's truth to speak into your life and let the, allow the Holy Spirit to flow His truth into your life and through you and wash you clean of a, of a corrupted way of thinking from a lifestyle of being exposed to wickedness from living in a wicked world. That's what true repentance is. And it's a supernatural act, but it comes from submission. See, you submit, I submit, then God does the rest supernaturally. And then you get it, and then he gives you the ability to live it out. But if we don't submit and humble ourselves before him, then you can't even begin to repent. Maybe you're struggling with repentance. Maybe you haven't submitted yet. You have to submit. And we live in a culture where that's not pleasing. That's not liking. That's not popular. You know, macho guys with, that's not a stereotype, but maybe it is. Macho guys with big old beards. I'll never submit. I'm like, UFC, I'm going to submit you. Oh, it's not about that. It's not about that. It's God is the ruler and creator. Submission is really meekness, which is power under control, is, is which what one of the characteristics of Jesus as he walked upon the earth, he could have obliterated this world in a heartbeat, but he was meek. His power was under control. You see, you can be the strongest man, the strongest woman, have the strongest character, but you need to submit. You need to learn submission. You see, for a married couple, husbands and wives, they need to learn to submit to God. And, 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 and husbands as well. You see, people always want to say, oh yeah, my wife has to submit. Well, who are you submitting to? Husband? You see, because if the husband doesn't submit to the Lord, then the whole marriage is out of whack. Been through that too. <laughs> Been there, done that, working on it still. You know, submission daily. The wife needs some godly man to follow after. So if your marriage is out of whack, yeah, we're going to have our issues. That's life, living in a fallen world. But if your marriage is constantly out of whack, the question has to be asked, husband, are you submitting? The wife is not going to submit willingly unless you submit. And if you submit, husband, then things are going to work out better because you're submitted and you're living in right standard. And the children, they're going to at least know. You see, it falls on everybody. If the parents are living right, if the husband's living right, then the wife lives right. If the husband and wife live right, then now it's on the children. They have to follow. And if they don't follow, then it's on them. It's on you. <laughs> you're choosing to go the wrong way. I've taught you the right way. You have to make the right decision. You see, we all have responsibility, right? You, you don't get out of this. You don't get a, I, I don't have to be responsible. We all have our part to play. Excuse me for my rambling. All right, going back to repentance. It's an urgent appeal for instant change of attitude and conduct before it's too late. You see, we serve Jesus Christ out of obedience, not out of emotion. I talked about this uh, moments ago. You know, emotions are so fickle. One minute I can be elated. The next minute I can be depressed. I don't serve Jesus out of my emotions. Because if you serve Jesus out of your emotions, what are you going to do when the chips fall? You're going to buck out. You're going to be like, I'm, I'm good. I'm not serving you anymore, Jesus. My family's falling apart. There's no food on the table. People around me dying of COVID. I got to wear this mask. <laughs> the, 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 the society's falling apart. And all of a sudden, people, they don't want to serve God anymore. They just join the other side. They say, oh, you know, it's, it's just better to join them. 
There's no real Bible believing churches anymore. It's not real. <laughs> really? Or is it you're just not looking? Or is it you're just not allowing the Lord to speak into your life? And it's so easy to point the finger and blame at everyone else, but then not look at our own circumstances and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? How are you trying to use my life? Maybe the whole thing is handle you and your family. Maybe the Lord's not asking you to do all these other things, but he's like, you better be a pillar in your family. You better stand and, and, and be there for your family. You know the Bible talks about the men are supposed to raise the children. Do you know that, right? It's not the women. See, we get it all mixed up. If the husband is not girded up in truth and raising his children up in truth, then you're failing as a father. Let me tell you this. Well, this is, again, from the Holy Spirit. It's not from me. If you have grandchildren, oh, my goodness. You've been given a second opportunity. Maybe you didn't do it right the first time, but if you got grandchildren, you got another opportunity. God's saying, here's my favor upon you, son. Maybe your son, your daughter, 40-some years old, they won't let you speak into their life anymore. Okay, but they got kids. You got grandchildren? You have another opportunity to plant seeds, to pour into the lives of souls in your bloodline to make a difference for the Lord. That's an encouragement for some of y'all in here. It really is. It really is. It, it, it's to be taken as truth. It's not me speaking. It's the Lord speaking through me. I truly do believe that. Okay, do the first works. We're back to this. He's saying, return to the first works. This means that they must go back to the basics, to the very first things they did when they first fell in love with Jesus Christ. These are things that we could never grow beyond. You see, what are the first works? Remembering how we used to spend time in his word. Remembering how we used to pray. Remember how we got when we would have joy from getting together with other Christians. Remember how exactly we were when we first came to Christ. The application is this. How, how we love, how we love others, it reveals how we love Jesus Christ. You see, we could say that Satan does a masterful job at creating a sense of dissatisfactions in the first works. Because many Christians will run after any new thing, any new thing, excuse me, any strange method or program to try to grow stability. You know, we have a short attention span. Many of us can't sit long. Many, many of us can't, 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 can't be told something for an extended amount of time because we get bored. And sometimes spiritually we get bored of the truest excitement of the first works. Sometimes we'll do anything but the first works because we've grown numb to the reality of Christ going to the cross and dying for us. Oh, I don't want to hear that anymore. That's how you get all these occults and all these weird derivatives of true Christianity because man has come in and said, we can alter this, we can shave this, we can cut this out, and it's not a good thing. He says, with a stern warning, if you don't go back to your first works and repent... I'm going to quickly remove your lampstand from its place. If the lampstand gets removed, if our lampstand gets removed, we can still function as an organization, but this will no longer be a living church. It's just a social club. It's just a group of people. First uh, Samuel f uh, chapter 4, verse 21 talks about this. Uh, if that happened, which I pray it doesn't, we would become like the church of Ichabod where the glory of God had departed. You, you don't want that. You don't want the glory of God to depart from you. That's a horrible thing. Get out of here, fly. <laughs> Psalm 51, 11, Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Oh, that is so beautiful. Uh, that should be a daily prayer for you and I. That's what King David said. He was like, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Don't take your presence from me, Lord. I need you that bad. Next, we see that Jesus encourages the Ephesian church. He says, but this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Jesus probably saw that. You know, they need to be encouraged because he came with some strong words. He said, you need to repent. And that's a hard thing right there. That's a strong word. And he says, if you don't repent, I'm going to take the lampstand away from you meaning his presence. So he had to encourage them. 
And he did. He encouraged them. He gave them another compliment. He complimented them because they hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans and their deeds. Uh, quickly about the Nicolaitans, they were basically just followers of this man, Nicholas. And um, it wasn't good, the things that they did. Uh, the name Nicholas literally means to conquer the people. So based on this, uh, some point to the, the claims that uh, apost uh, apostolic uh, authority was set up in this hierarchy, basically that separated the clergy from the lame people, and that these Nicolaitans were just trying to have control over things. You kind of get a little sense of that from some of the other religious groups and how they operate. The Nicolaitans, like all deceivers that come from the body of Christ, claimed that they weren't destroying Christianity, but they were presenting an improved modern version of it. We see this going on in our world today, and unfortunately we see it going on in the church today. We must know, the application is this, we must know the Word of God so that we are not deceived. We need to be like the Bereans and study out the Word of God. I'll say it again. Don't ever let me or any other man that steps in this pulpit speak into your life without you cross-checking what's going on. You need, and, and in order for you to do that, clearly you need to have the Holy Spirit living in you. You need to have discernment. You need to study out the scriptures for yourself. Don't come in here blind. You can come in here blind if you're a young believer or you're not a believer at all. But if you're a mature believer or you claim to be a mature believer, this should be part of your MO. Whenever you listen to a pastor or teaching on the radio or the internet, decipher whether or not truth is coming through this vessel or if it's lies. Because there are many demons, demon-possessed pastors that are preaching and teaching in pulpits all across the world. And it's true. Demonic forces are alive and active. The greatest threat to the church is from those wolves within the church posing as authentic believers. Jesus says, I hate this. You see, these are powerful words from our Lord and Savior. And some think, well, man, he's so rich in love. How could he say he hates? Whatever the Nicol Nicolaitans were and whatever exactly they did and taught, we learned something from Jesus' opinion of them. We learned that God, God loves to hate sin in the sense of he can't stand it. He cannot be in the same vicinity of sin. He's holy, meaning set apart. And he wants his people also to hate sin. The application is this. Righteous anger is a good thing. Not flying off the handle for no reason, just because somebody spilled some milk. And, you know, unfortunately, I've been, <laughs> I've been, uh, you know, I've been guilty of that within my own home. Getting all frustrated and all this. And, ah, they're little kids, man. They gotta, they, they're going to make mistakes. But I'm talking about a righteous anger. You see, you should, I should hate the sin in our own lives. We should hate it. You should hate the sin that, 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 that comes from a wicked heart that needs to be, uh, you know, uh, brought through submission to Christ through sanctification. I, I hate when I sin. You should hate it too. I didn't say hate yourself. Not self-defecation, not, not defaming your character, but you should hate the sin that can easily entang you, entangle you. Excuse me. You see, sin is not a big old puppy dog. You don't want to cuddle up next to sin, roll around with it on the ground, let it lick you on the face. No. Get as far away from sin as you possibly can. You see, because it's a slippery slope. We talked about this earlier. Entertaining these thoughts, these ideas that are ungodly. It can lead you astray. It could lead you into a lifestyle where you are bound up. And it's going to take a strong supernatural act to get you out of that. The stronghold that, that you've unfortunately brought upon yourself. You see, sin always under delivers and keeps you longer than you want to stay. No matter how much fun you have. Yes, is sin appealing? Of course. That's what makes people go to it. But in the end, sin destroys physically and spiritually. Last verse, 7. He says, Jesus says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. He who has an ear. This is a beautiful thing. This is why Jesus Christ is unlike any other false god. It's not about works. It's not about what we do. It's not about, again, it's not about us. It's about what he does. It says he qualifies everyone, or at least everyone who will listen, anyone who will listen. 
This letter was not only written to the, uh, the church in Ephesus in, in, in John's day, but it's written to all of us, to all Christians throughout the centuries. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You see, each letter to the church in the book of Revelation is to every church. The application is this. We must hear what the Spirit says to the churches. What is he saying to you? What is he saying to me? You see, these letters, each of them, were meant to speak to you and I if we would only have an ear to listen to what the Spirit has to say. Sometimes we just don't want to listen. Sometimes that's just what we need to do, is listen. You don't know what to do today? You're in a situation, you don't know how to get out of your circumstance, you don't know how things are going to work out? Listen for that still, small voice. What is the Lord trying to reveal to you? Right? You know, right? prayer is a two-way street. Prayer is not just me talking. That's sometimes we miss it because we're talking too much. The Lord's like, be still. That's his gentle way of saying, shut up and listen to me. Let me impress upon your heart what I'm trying to do for you. Let me impress upon your heart which way I'm trying to show you to go. And through his word, he will confirm it. And through another believer, he will confirm it. And now you can go. But we have to... That's a mature thing, right? It's a mature thing to listen, to just be still. As I talked about earlier, a lot of times we're already creating a rebuttal. We're already forming an opinion instead of letting the Holy Spirit speak to us in such a way that we can really get it and then apply it to our lives. The promise of a reward. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life to which, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. To him who overcomes. This is beautiful. Jesus made this promise to him who overcomes. But what, what does this overcoming look like? We usually think of overcoming in some kind of dramatic terms like, you know, overcoming some sin in, in, in spiritual warfare. But, but here Jesus seems to speak of overcoming the coldness of their heart and lack of love marked by leaving their first love. Who is Jesus Christ? This is it right here. This is the thing, right? It's so subtle. You can't miss this. If you overcome the coldness of heart, you won't abandon your first love. You overcome sin through Jesus Christ. If you do that, you have to stay intact with him. Keep short accounts with him. This is, uh, as the worship team comes up, I'm wrapping it up right now. He says, I will give to eat of the tree of life if you and I do this. You see, the promise for these overcomers was a return to Eden, a restoration in the sense of an eternal life. Not, not necessarily Eden as it was back then, but the premise, that whole concept of having uninterrupted, unhindered communion with God for eternity. This was meant first in the eternal sense of making it heaven, which is no small promise to a church threatened with the removal of Jesus' presence. It's also meant in the sense of seeing the effects of the curse roll back in their own lives by walking in Jesus Christ redeemed in love in the midst of the paradise of God. Originally, this word paradise meant a garden of delight. Eventually, it came to mean the place where God lives. God's paradise. Remember the thief on the cross? <laughs> It's a beautiful thing. He humbled himself. I'll end with this. Luke chapter 23, verses 39 down through 43. It says, One of the criminals who were hanging railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he, speaking of Jesus Christ, said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. May we be those who recognize that it's our understanding of who Jesus Christ is that truly matters the most. That's where everything begins and ends. Is who do you say Christ is? Who is he to you? Is he your Messiah? Is he your Jehovah Jireh, your provider? Is he your, st your strong tower, your mighty fortress? Is he the one to you that you cling to, whether you are happy or you're hurting? 
Let us find our hope in nothing more than his finished work on the cross. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the revelation of who Jesus Christ is to us. Lord, we've received the knock at the door of our hearts. And we open up the doors of our hearts and we say, come, please dine with us. Be friends with us. Make us new. Make us whole. Make us right before your Father. There's no better place to be than in your presence at your feet. Lord, would you have favor upon us? Would your mercy increase? Would your favor increase upon our lives? Would you help us to be faithful in the tasks that you have for us to do? May our lives bring you honor and glory in all that we do. May we not fear. May we be like Joshua and be encouraged that we're walking with you, rather that you're walking with us, and that every step of the way, we have victory. No matter what it looks like from a worldly perspective, we have victory. Father, we thank you, and we love you. We pray this all in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen.